Go ahead. Hi, my name is Dan Winter. I'm a psychophysiologist. I work in biofeedback and have discovered some very interesting things about the electrical nature of emotion. And in the process of doing that, we've been doing uh, frequency signatures or harmonics of the heart at the moments when people feel bliss and joy and compassion. And we've discovered that at moments when people have intense emotions, their heart creates frequency pictures which are a powerful indicator that they're doing something electrical inside their body when they have emotions. And recently with my friend Will here, we've been having these conversations about this Technocalypse television documentary that's kind of sweeping Europe. And we're a little troubled about a certain part of that. It has to do with the way in which they seem to be urging you to consider using uh, little microchips and other ways to uh, include machinery as part of biology. And they're kind of saying, well, there's nothing sacred about the shape of the body and the electric electricity of the heart, and machines can be doing this better. And so then we're actually stuck in the middle of something of a quandary because my work on emotion has suggested to me that we could actually answer a profound question about what is the purpose of DNA in an entirely new way, which gives us a completely different view of what we should be doing with the relationship of technology to biological substances. So our little fun answer to this question of what is the purpose of DNA is very brief. It's called Bliss and the Magnetic X, and that's really the subject of our little story today. And it has to do with this idea that we believe we've discovered some um, secrets, some visions to exactly how human passionate bliss-related emotion actually gets into the genetic material. And therefore, emotion's ability to program and shape, and we're going to talk about braid the DNA, has everything to do with the genetic material having been in this profound shape which nature put it in. And if we go messing in there with this genetic engineering and all these chips in your cells, we stand to actually affect dramatically whether or not emotion can continue to program DNA. So in order to tell you this story, I'm going to show you some pictures of what we're calling the Magnetic X Generation. And it's kind of play on words from this old story of there's this, you know, we had this post-World War II generation, the baby boom, and then there was the X Generation. And the notion here is that if you feel enough bliss, it has an effect on your DNA, and we'll see that's been measured. So your DNA becomes a magnetic X. It's kind of a fun notion. So here are the pictures. First we look at this idea that, in fact, the X chromosome, which sort of, sort of determines what it is that makes woman versus man, actually has a magnetic field around it. This field is based on the geometry of the microtubules at the moment of cell meiosis or mitosis, cell division. And so you see that really this division of the, the DNA, the cell division moment of this living cell, is dependent on whether the X chromosome is literally, in a sense, magnetic. So the timing of cell replication, which when it's orderly, it's not cancer, and when it's disorderly, it is cancer, is dependent upon a magnetic field to align the microtubules and the DNA in this lovely ritual dance. So if the magnetic field's messed up, obviously the timing of cell division is going to be messed up. So we need to understand where does the magnetic field around DNA come from. This is a picture from the early, and you can even zoom in right here. This is the early x-ray photographs of DNA when they first tried to model genetic material as having a double helix. The Watson and Crick moment was when they were in, able to interpret this magnetic X. They made an X-ray photograph. They said, oh, the only way you could cast an X-ray shadow of the DNA protein was to, to account for that. It had to be a double helix. So 
DNA as a double helix was first discovered specifically because, literally, the X-ray shadow of DNA was an X. It's a magnetic X. And we're going to see that has meaning in terms of what's squirting out of the places where the DNA crosses itself. You know, crosses itself, sort of makes a blessing. Well, the cross on the cross turns out to be the mechanism of braiding, which we'll see in a minute, may in fact be emotion-induced. So. What we're getting to here is there might be a reason not to mess with the spacing between the codons of your DNA. And while all these biologists who are hacking up your DNA in this genetic engineering call it junk DNA, they're affecting the spacing which affects whether this X cross in your DNA works to make a good harmonic squirt gun, a harmonic cascade, a way of laddering the frequencies. So let's look at some more of the pictures. The idea is that in the genetic material you have a nest of magnetic fields where each of the magnetic fields is like a donut inside a donut. And when the donuts or field effects nest properly in the DNA, then they make this X, which we'll see can actually project harmonics out through the throat of the X. And this becomes a way later we can talk about how DNA gets a field effect that goes faster than light. But let's just take another little simple picture here of how the braiding works. This is like what, how you make a ponytail in your DNA. So the point is, what, what the scientists who have been talking about your DNA may have been forgetting here is the difference between the short wave, which is this helix, versus this wave on the wave of the wave on the wave. So you get this braiding going on where you're going down the throat, where when finally you see this actual X in your DNA, What's actually happened is there's been a braid on the braid of the braid of the braid. And you have this very long wave now superposed in your DNA. Let's tell that story for a second, and we're going to cut to a little movie here. In order to understand our movie, we need to understand what it feels like to look down DNA as a slinky from the top. And this is the picture from New Scientist magazine where it shows that the way genetic material looks like from the top is a ten-sided figure. Notice it looks like you have a little kind of a black hole or a linear accelerator or maybe a squirt gun down the center. So now we can play our little movie. Here's another view of the top down looking into that ratcheted dodecahedra. And as that dodecahedron ratchets down, we see that the double helix in your genetic material is a wavelength here, which is, this wavelength here is in the ultraviolet spectra, okay? So it's literally a high quality ultraviolet or blue light. Later we're going to call it blue fire. But you see that we've drawn in the double helix here as a blue and purple helix, okay? And so that helix is a short wave in your DNA. But what the genetic engineers may have forgotten is they're all excited that they now understand the letters, but they don't understand how the words and the syntax requires a phrase within a sentence, within a paragraph, within a book. And it's that context richness or context embedding which is the braid on your DNA. And you see how this is a braid of the short wave on the long wave? So the information that's in your DNA actually has these waves here, which are very long waves, which is a wave on a wave on a wave on a wave waving. That's called super looping. And that's actually a picture of how harmonics nest in, say, things like your heart, where, for example, in your heartbeat, you have your heart, you have your heart beat as a wave, and then you have your heart rate as a wave. And then you have your breath as a longer wave yet, so you have a wave on a wave waving. And that's the process of embedding and the embedding or nesting of how short waves can nest inside of long waves where the interference between them is all constructive is based on something called perfect nesting or perfect branching, which turns out to be exactly in Mother Nature what she calls phi low taxes. 
And that's how leaves branch in these trees around us, in the lovely trees. The way the branch happens is that this branch, with related, re relationship to this branch, chooses the place to unfurl so that the geometry of the leaf structure actually solves the problem of perfect sharing. So you've got this one leaf that says, oh, I need to share the light so that there's maximum exposure, minimum superposition. And what Mother Nature discovered is in order to do this, the way the leaves branch is they do a one, two, three, four, I'm sorry, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. Okay? It's called the Fibonacci progression. And that progression is such that if you take any two numbers in the sequence and add them, you get the next one, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, etc. The point is that that Fibonacci progression, which is perfect branching, perfect nesting, uh, actually leads to the ratio, the golden mean, which is called phi. Often it's symbolized by the Greek letter phi, which is a circle with a vertical line through it. And phi, the golden mean ratio, is the solution to perfect nesting or perfect branching. And we're going to see later that that harmonic ratio actually shows up in the heartbeat as the space between harmonics in the chord, the music of the heart, deciding what chord to play. And when the space between harmonics is a multiple of phi, the golden ratio, it appears people are generally having an emotion that's heart-centered or open or blissful. And so Mother Nature is solving the problem of perfect sharing by solving the problem of perfect branching, which turns out to be the solution to the problem of perfect nesting, which is the solution to perfect compression. So all of these things are related to the golden ratio or the golden mean or the sacred cut. You know, the sarcophagus in the Great Pyramid has that shape, that square, and you have that shape in the Parthenon in Athens, Greece. Okay, so sacred structures use this shape to embed magnetism. Well, it turns out that genetic material is all about that shape, and we'll see some pictures in a minute. So let's go back here now to the magnetic X, and we'll look for that ratio in DNA. So now here we have some pictures of the genetic material. And again, this is the top-down view of, of the DNA right here. And you can even zoom in on a bit. But it turns out that if you map the way the DNA helix is ratcheted, the golden ratio is the distance between the rungs of the ladder right there, okay? And the golden ratio squared, it, that's called the vertical increment of turn. The golden ratio, or phi squared right there, is the horizontal increment of turn. And then the radius of the turn, which is this distance from here to here in angular measure, is golden mean cubed. So length, area, and volume, golden mean, golden mean squared, and golden mean cubed are preserved in a ratchet. It's a simple way of saying that no matter how you cook it, genetic material uses this ratio. In fact, if you look at the center uh, rung or one step on the ladder of DNA, it's one codon rung of the ladder. The geometry of that rung is often modeled as a golden ratio pentagram, stars within stars, where all the ratios are golden mean, and the center bond in the DNA down the zipper is actually, it's, a non, it's called a nonlinear hydrogen bond. It's often been thought of as being responsible for aging, the stability of that bond at the zipper down the slinky is also a golden mean rectangle. And we can see that here where the actual models of how the DNA rung works. You have a pentagonal bond next to a hexagonal bond. And that 5-6 relationship right there, here shown in the guadine-cytosine relationship and also in the adenine-thymine relationship. These are just how the latter or the slinky of DNA is braided. And that brings us to the little picture of the slinky. Let's look at the slinky here for a second. <clears throat> See, what happens because your DNA looks like a slinky is the fact that there's a mechanical way to couple a short wave to a long wave. For example, 
Uh, quartz is a slinky, the SiO2, the silicon dioxide helix of the long z-axis optically of quartz, is also a slinky like DNA. Now the reason Mother Nature uses slinkies in order to teach us about how to connect, connect long waves and short waves is very easy to understand. What happens in a slinky is, here is my hand changing the length of this slinky like this. Okay, that's a long wave. Okay, but as I do it, notice that the sides of the slinky get skinnier. So I have the sides of the slinky getting skinnier like this. See how that pulls in and gets skinnier? While the length of the slinky is a long wave, the width of the slinky is a short wave. And yet these two motions are connected. Long wave, sound or stricture it's called in piezoelectricity, and short wave or voltage. So here you have a sound wave, a long wave, connected mechanically because of the slinky to a short wave, a voltage. And that's one of the ways in which Mother Nature uses the slinky shape of DNA to connect long waves to short waves. Well, the fun part of our Magnetic X story is that in genetic material, what happens is the DNA is mechanically connected to the sound waves of the heart. So earlier, when we measured the harmonics of the heart, let's look at how the harmonics or the frequencies of the heart beat actually affect this what's called context richness in DNA. In order to tell that story, I need to tell you about a book I read a while ago. The book is called Grammatical Man, Information, Entropy, Language, and Life by Jeremy Campbell. And he is discussing this problem of how genetic material got to be what he called high signal to noise ratio, which essentially means that, well, here's the DNA and it's like millions of times a day taking the RNA, mating it to a DNA codon and saying, oh, we've replicated, it's like a transistor made an accurate switching. The thing is, the DNA makes this switching operation, this mating of pairs, like sticking two pieces of puzzle together, millions of times a day. And it does it with such incredibly accurate, incredible accuracy, it's called high signal to noise ratio. Well, in this book by Jeremy Camel, Grammatical Man, he tries to scratch his head and say, golly, how did the genetic material get to be so able to make millions of these information transactions and make so few mistakes. And after lots of fun in the book, he finally decides it's a language problem. It's exactly like if you had a book and the book was made of letters. And so the letters are like ABC and all these words, and then you had a word within a paragraph, and then a paragraph within a chapter, and then a chapter in a book. Now supposing Little Johnny got the book out one day and used his pencil and scribbled out a couple letters. And there were a couple letters missing in the book. Well, the fact is, if you were sitting there reading the book, you'd have so much information about the context that, in fact, you'd be able to replace the missing letters. This is called what he called context dependency or context richness in genetic material. Well. His answer to the question of how genetic material got to be so accurate in making these information transactions was that because there is so much context richness, so much like, well, here's the example he gave. He said, if you were a computer programmer and you were trying to debug DNA, but it was exactly like debugging a program written, let's say it was written in a high-level computer language like C++. Now in a high-level computer language, you take one instruction and you effectively have grabbed a hold of a block of machine code operations that's huge. It's like a whole nest of operations. So in fact, if you wanted to debug some fancy program that was making pretty pictures on your screen, and somebody showed you the machine code, this little hexadecimal location that said add to and multiply over here, you'd be like in a, in a swamp of soup that would like mess you up forever if you tried to debug the software using the machine code. So what you have to do to debug a program is look at the context or long ch chunks or blocks of code. 
And these long chunks or blocks of code is what we call a high-level programming language, which is basically like C++ or DBase. Well, the thing is, now we've got these genetic engineers today, and they just got so excited, and we congratulate them. It's very useful. But what they figured out is the letters in the code. They don't have a clue what the words mean yet, and they don't even know that a thing, such a thing as a paragraph existed. And if somebody so told them there's such a thing as a chapter, the only way we discover that level of meaning in, in the genetic material is this thing called context richness. Now, context richness is the same thing you see as this embedding or nesting we just saw the animation about. So, when you saw that short wave, which is an ultraviolet wave, which is the helix of DNA, that is, in fact, what your genetic engineer now thinks he understands. He thinks he understands how one code sits next to the other in this simple slinky, which is useful, but it's only the very beginning. Because, in fact, what happens is that now you take this sequence of a certain series of codons in this little slinky, and you take this and you braid it into an envelope where the wave fits in this lovely little envelope. And you have an envelope on an envelope on an envelope. It's like saying, oh, the answer lies folded in an envelope. But that's easy to understand because if you took thread and then you kind of braided it, you might have string. And then if you braided that string, you'd have a rope. And then if you braided that rope, you'd have a very fat rope. Now, if you were done, you'd have a wave the length of that very fat rope, which is a very long wave, which contains the wave of the string and the wave of the thread. But yet, if you were debugging where that rope is going, you couldn't get a clue about the meaning of the long wave by looking at just the letters, the short wave, the thread. The point is that the way Mother Nature decodes DNA is, here you have this sequence, it's like genetic material is, is lumped into these groups for a very important reason. It has to do with like, the way you decode DNA is because after it's braided into the rope, the actual waves that are tucked inside do not get mechanical access to the RNA. So, mechanically, what's happening is the DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid, is able to share its templates, its codons, its cookie cutters, so the half helix can say, okay, Walt's in here, RNA, and mate, to see if these two things fit together. That can't even begin to happen unless, mechanically, the DNA has access to the RNA. So from a mechanical point of view, if, if you're some of the DNA and you're tucked inside the thick, fat rope, you don't have access to the RNA. So guess what's happening? That particular section of code does not get read. And so, in fact, whatever mechanically does this long wave braiding in your DNA is what's called switching the active sites. The programmer! So, in fact, what the genetic material has a way of deciding what groups of codes do in fact replicate. Now this has been a mystery to genetic engineers for a long time that even in fact say in the cases of AIDS where you have this virus and it's there in your cell but it appears to be dormant and then suddenly if you get a cold or you get depressed and in fact if you get depressed you're more likely to get a cold and then then suddenly your immune system is weakened and then this virus switches on. So what they didn't understand is mechanically what is the way in which a group of code is switched on. It's just like you're waltzing up this little ladder of your DNA and because of the braid the DNA knows read 2, skip 4, read 6, skip 4, read 2, skip 6. Now the way that's done is the braiding. But if you're this simple mechanical engineer that has made simply a map of which codon is next to each other, knows the letters, but doesn't know the words or the paragraphs or the context or the syntax, then you're in big trouble because, in fact, you don't know how certain sequences of the codes are, in fact, deciding to replicate. Now, <laughs> 
the really fun part of this little story that I'd like to get to. I call it the storal to the mori, which is a funny way of saying the moral to the story, is that it might just be that your emotion, this mechanical sound wave, this long wave that comes from your EKG, is in fact the way in which your DNA gets braided. See, we already know that genetic material has to have a way of making groups switched on and off. And we suspect that's what's called stoichiochemic or stoichiochemical or structure related or simply shape related. So we're not going to get to the clue of which groups of codes in DNA get switched on and off by simply looking at which little codons are in a row. We're going to have to look at the long wave structure. The long wave structure, as we just saw from the braiding animation, is in fact an image of how sound waves, or very long, it's called phonon, which is just a name for sound in the liquid. So you have these sound waves, or phonon waves, in fact, mechanically braiding your DNA. I hypothesized this or suggested this as a theory many years ago. I was I was working with the HeartMath Institute in California and I wrote a chapter, it's also on my website at danwinter.com, and the chapter was called Braiding DNA is Emotion the Weaver. The actual link to this is at danwinter.com slash magnetic x. And in that book, in that little story there, what I suggested was that emotion may be, the, may be the weaver of this pattern, this long wave structure in your DNA. Well, we had these long conversations at the HeartMath Institute, and at that point, there was a scientist there named Glenn Ryan who did an experiment based on the hypothesis at my suggestion. And the experiment he did was very simple. What he did is, when the DNA slinky or helix splits or replicates, there is an enzyme that's associated with how much uh, glue or how much bonding has happened at what I call the zipper down the center of your DNA. The zipper is where the actual nonlinear hydrogen bond at the two halves of the codon break and mate each time. And that zipper is associated with a very particular enzyme. And all Glenn Ryan did was measure for the presence of that enzyme during DNA replication, splitting and uh, recombining. And what he found was very profound, and we, with his permission, reprinted the paper that was published in the ISSEM, the International Society for the Study of Energy magazine. And the article is reprinted at danwinter.com slash Rhine. That's R-E-I-N. And what he found, to summarize very simply, was that the presence of the enzyme in the, that makes the slinky bond and unbond, that actually is the, is the zipper, you could say, the presence of that enzyme very dramatically with the amount of musical coherence in the heart. So here you have this heart harmonics, the heart sounds, actually affecting how tightly the DNA slinky was doing the braiding. And look what happens when you braid the slinky. You get this lovely little nest of, uh, uh, of donuts, okay? You get a nest on a nest. Well, the slinky doing this in your DNA happens mechanically, directly, measurably, in response to the orderliness of the sound harmonics coming from the heart. So let's take a little break here and we'll switch to some images of that. We wanted to just make the point that if we look at the harmonics in the heart at moments of intense emotion, we do in fact see these lovely cascades here. This is a biofeedback device we're working with that I invented called the HeartLink, and we'll have a new version soon. But what we do is we take the heart voltage here, the EKG or ECG, and we analyze the music coming from the heart between 0 and 20 cycles, and we see this cascade 
very similar to what we saw in brain waves, alpha, theta, and delta, same bandwidth. But then, what we see is when the great amount of coherence or music does come from the EKG dynamically, if we take the second order frequency signature, FFT, called septrum, we see that the space between harmonics is 1 over the golden mean ratio, 0.62. So, in fact, the space between these harmonics here is 1.618, as close as we can measure, which is the golden mean ratio. So, it appears that this, this interstitial spacing between harmonics is generating a cascade musically in the heart, which is very coherent. And in fact, we believe that if we take large numbers of people and analyze this space between harmonics right here, as it moves down from 1.0 to more space between harmonics, we actually have a table with large numbers of people saying they feel their emotion changing from head-centered to heart-centered, to more membrane-making, to membrane-bridging behavior. So this spaces in the heart, space between harmonics, may actually be related to the way in which emotion is programming your DNA. So now we're going to look at this harmonic cascade here, as it might help us to understand how this music in the heart is actually creating the nest of electrical fields or donuts, which is like a cascade or caduceus that's affecting the way DNA is braided by creating a magnetic field around the heart, which may be the way emotion fabricates ecosystems, how you kind of build your world with emotion. So what we're going to do now is we're going to analyze the ratio or how the pattern allows the nest of voltage donuts to converge around the heart. Essentially, we're asking the question, where does the heartbeat come from electrically? This is, we're saying poetically, where do the pressures in the heart sort themselves out? Yet, pressure or tension is Tesla's word for voltage. So, we're going to the literature now, and we're going to look at this book called When Time Breaks Down, the three-dimensional dynamics of cardiac arrhythmia by Arthur T. Winfrey, okay? And in this book, which is the kind of technical biophysics of the electrical origin of where the heartbeat comes from, we see that biophysics' technical answer today to the origin of the heart's beat is not just a concentric nest of donuts within donuts, but it's actually a three-dimensional revolved spiral that continuously re-dimples or returns inside out or reinserts itself or self-re-enters or self-refers. And we're going to see that this geometry of self-reference may be the issue of self-awareness and self-steering systems. This is a picture of each of the voltage donuts that converges at the heart. And we see that each of those vo voltage donuts is modeled on the fact that the seven color map on the surface of a donut is self-organizing. And that's called a Mobius strip. And it's how a field effect can become self-feeding. And this spiral on this donut is able to self-re-enter because it, in fact, may be related to the golden mean spiral. So now, looking at the next picture, we see that this is just a clearer drawing, that this heart is making a decision right here at this little point, which I call the dimpling point, or the turning inside-out point, that a form of suction has begun to exist electrically, which is allowing this field effect to be pulled into this field effect. And in fact, what I believe is that the size of these field effects when the ratio between harmonics in the EKG is related to the golden ratio, the size of the magnetic donuts that converge to make the heart fire, where the heart is electrified, being golden mean ratio creates implosion at the center point. It's literally creating a little bit of gravity or suction or self-embedding which draws to the center and thus creates that centering force, which we'll later see has a profound psychological meaning. So if we were to look here at what would allow this implosion to create more attraction, 
This could even get romantic. We could talk about the nature of romantic attraction based on the fact that the heart literally may become a fractal attractor at the moment of bliss. And when the attraction is complete, this little dimple turns into a tornado and then goes through the center again and sucks in a longer wave and then a longer wave yet. So the phenomena we actually get is that the heart harmonics actually extend themselves and the cascade completes itself. So the heart in this sense ascends the ladder of frequencies climbing the number of donuts. Let's look at this picture. The number of donuts which get sucked in becomes a very long wave. So this becomes a picture of the way in which the sound and the voltages of the heart's beat actually become a mechanism for creating a sonic ponytail which actually affects the DNA. So we're going to look at some pictures now of how this pressure is created in the heart. This is the central structure of the heart. This is like, looks like a, a vortex or a spiral strip. This is a drawing of what the heart looks like clairvoyantly in the theos theosophy literature. But we see that the origin of the heartbeat mechanically is based on the seven layers of muscle which comprise how the heart is constructed mechanically. And these seven layers of muscle turn out to be layered according to the seven spins of the tetrahedron, which turns out to be the best way to squeeze. And so we'll just kind of zoom out here now and look at that symmetry. The symmetry begins with the cube octa, which is incubating or very containing. But then once you have the icasa in this little jitterbug, you have the uh, beginning of self-embedding because the icasa dodeca is golden ratio. And then if we collapse that further, we have the diamond or the octahedron. And then if I keep my hands plain parallel and perpendicular in this lovely little Buckminster Fuller jitterbug, okay, if I keep my hands plain parallel, I create the tetrahedron, okay. And in the tetrahedron, I have the maximum number of spin symmetries or axes of spin possible on one surface. Four of them are face center spins. This is vertex to face center spins. There's four like this because there's four tips. Tetra means four. And then in addition, there's three spins that look like this, which are edge center pair axes of symmetry for a total of seven arrows through the heart which is the title of the book of a book about the heart called The Seven Arrows by Hiram the Storm. But the point in this picture now we have on the computer screen is that the seven layers of the heart's muscle are actually tilted. You can see this one's kind of at this angle. And this is at a, a, a shallower angle and shallower and this is almost flat. So these seven tilt angles to the layers of heart muscle means the heart could squeeze the blood into a vortex. The point here is that the heart is not really a pump. In the work by Marinelli in Detroit, he showed that the way the heart pumps the blood is it throws it in this little vortex. And so you have these different layers of heart muscle going squeeze, 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 squeeze squeeze in every possible axis of symmetry that you could superpose on one folded surface. And because the heart can make a decision which layer to squeeze in what sequence, the heart can throw a vortex. And the way the vortex chooses its tilt angle, the decision to choose which layer of the heart muscle fires in what order is based on the tilt of those magnetic donuts for which one converges at the heart, causing which layer of muscle to fire, which shapes the geometry of pressure or the geometry of squeezing, which chooses what tilt angle of this vortex to actually cast a sound shadow of the harmonics of the heart on the thymus gland, and the thymus is this lovely little catcher's mitt. Or you got this beating heart here, and you got this catcher's mitt, the thymus, the thy am us, mea copa, mea copa, which doesn't mean through my fault. It means I take responsibility for, I thump my thymus, because it's the sounds of the heart where you take responsibility for the way your emotion fabricated the shape of the magnetic field, which is your world. So that's why we say, 
uh, sacred geometry and coherent emotion because the sacred geometry, which is the shape which organized the heart muscles firing, is what makes the coherence, the orderliness of the sound and electricity of the heart, able to fabricate your world. So this ability then of taking responsibility for your emotion becomes then how you create the braid potentially in your own DNA based on these, this series of pressures, phonon waves, sound waves, coming from your heart in this, this ponytail. I like to tell a story that if, if, you, if you really cared about someone and you wanted to show that, you often would kind of help braid their hair. And when you braid their hair, you do this motion where you take two strands of hair like this and you divide the hair about evenly, and then you do this motion in order to do the braiding, which is you do this over, and then under, and then over, and then under, and then each time your hands got closer together because the braid was getting shorter, right? Well, if you took the hair out of your hand and instead put a pen in your hand, you would have drawn the frequency signature of the harmonics of the EKG of the heart at the moment of love. And so you can begin to understand kind of mechanically what Glenn Ryan measured in that study, which is how the sounds of your heart mechanically braid your DNA. And so let's take a break and we'll look at some more pictures. So I was fortunate to work with this molecular biologist, PhD, Dr. Adoniah McKinsey from Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. And she wrote an article saying that with the discovery of recombinant DNA biotechnology, essentially genetic engineering, humanity made off with Mother Nature's scissors. Uh, unfortunately, we know less than she. The part of the article I'd like to discuss here is where she says, quote, it is assumed that the preponderance of junk DNA that intervenes between coding regions is inefficient, useless, and could be removed for greater streamlining. In actuality, these spans serve multiple biological functions, cancer prevention, gene inductions, and should be left in place within the genome. She then discusses what she calls jumping genes, and that, that if they, genetic, engineering, uh, genetic engineers attenuate non-coding regions, that is, cut them out, they may increase the likelihood of jumping gene-induced cancer. Well, the article is getting a little bit technical, but very simply, we're beginning to get the sense that we must understand how it is that the mechanical spacing between the gaps in the slinky of your DNA is actually the issue of proper genetic function. And then further in the article, Dr. Adam, Adoniah McKinsey goes on to say, and I'll just read this briefly, intervening sequences, introns, can be necessary for effective gene induction. For G DNA to be converted to RNA from a coding sequence, an upstream promoter must be induced. And what she further says then basically is that this upstream promoter, this intron, has to find the intron has to find that the space it climbs in the ladder, the mechanical interval has to be kind of musically right. So the spacing between the rungs of the ladder, even mechanically as it's braided, have so much to do with how groups of genetic material actually are able to do this jumping gene and the work of the introns where they move themselves between groups of codons. So the mechanical position of the groups becomes the issue, which is just what we were saying about braiding. And then at the end of the article, Dr. McKenzie, says, and you can read the article again at danwinter.com slash magneticx, which is the article that originally helped us work on this piece. In the end of her article, she says, oh yes, and by the way, there are magnetic field effects in the genetic material that can't happen if this long wave structural alignment doesn't happen. So she begins to start giving us this clue again that, golly, we need this magnetic field effect in order for DNA to work properly, and the magnetic field effect can't happen without the long wave braiding, and the long wave braiding just simply can't be this embeddable nesting if the genetic engineers keep slicing out little segments of the slinky, not realizing what the long wave is about in DNA.
So that brings us to some of the other pictures, which really have to do with, let's see if we can find the pictures here. I, the one I wanted to show you here, here's the slinky, okay? This is the one where we're showing that the ratio of the diameter of the DNA helix to one full 10 turn ratchet, 20 to 34 angstroms, very closely approaches the golden mean ratio. And further, that, remember we were talking about the top down view? Here's another picture of the top down view. I wanted to play this picture. You see that if you saw the magnetic donuts as a kind of cloud or uh, uh, smoke ring donuts formation, you have this 10 sided view, and then you have this picture from the biophysics literature. If we zoom in right here, we see that each rung of the ladder of DNA is actually based on this accurate 36 degree angle, one tenth of a circle. Uh, 36 degrees is one tenth of 360. So you have this braiding based on the decagram. Remember we showed this top down view decagram, this helix. So now we can understand back over here that in this top down view, maybe if you zoomed in really close here, just right on this part right here, you see that the waves are able to add and multiply as they concrest themselves into that nest. And this creates the perfect compression, which is literally happening right in the center of the slinky of your DNA. And this is the issue of the perfect squirt gun, which was back here. Let's see if we can find it. Ah, right here. Here's the squirt gun action. Let's move this. I'm going to move this to center just a little bit. Just, okay. And you see that now we've got this X right here. Okay. You understand now that you had a braid of the braid of the braid on the braid. And eventually you get this X right here where many short waves and many long waves cross each other right at the center. And that creates the phenomena of this harmonic cascade right here, which is literally the mouth of the X. That's the magnetic X. And the point is, what we believe is, the wave fronts at that point begin adding and multiplying. And I'm moving this again, sorry about that. I just want you to see the rest of this picture. See how the wave fronts begin adding and multiplying because of the perfect nesting of the wave on the wave. And that's what we believe is literally the implosion which sends the wavelength through the speed of light at the center of DNA. And there's an animation I'd like to play for you in just a second about that. So here we're actually taking another look at the, the ratio of the donuts, except all I've done is I've revolved the sine wave in 3D so it looks like a flame or fire. And the ratio between the size of the harmonics is based on the golden ratio. So you get this con concres concrescence, we called it. And you can see how this phi's ray or golden ratio could be almost thought of like fire. And we call this how the grid is ignited, but it's really just how the heart is ignited, how the fire is lit. And this is a little animation we prepared so you see how these heart harmonics become ordered right here. The harmonics become very nested, and that creates a cascade where the frequency signature of the harmonics at the moment of bliss shows that the second order frequency harmonic analysis looks like it's the wave you started with. The wave is in the wave embedded, and the interval between harmonics is golden ratio, as close to 0.618 as we can measure. And that creates this pattern of what's called perfect bifurcation or perfect branching. Okay, this is branching. One, two, three, five, eight. And the space between the branches is actually based on golden ratio, as is the nesting of the Mandelbrot set of perfect fractality, which is simply perfect embedding or perfect nesting, which we'll see in a minute is the business of perfect turning inside out nest or perfect compression. So bifurcation or how to divide without dividing, the solution to the problem of separateness is solved by this phylotaxis of perfect branching. And that creates that perfect spin path into the center, which is that three-dimensional golden mean spiral. And I just want to back this up just a little bit. So you see here that if we take those same ten spirals of the golden mean, and we had seen them from the top view, 
it would look exactly like the top-down view of DNA we just saw. Yet, if now we see that revolve from the side view, what those spirals embed, here we've gone 32 degrees, which is from the hex to the pent. We've gone from a, a, a five-sided to a six-sided view. And if we revolve fur further now, we see the side view of these two, what look like pine cones right here. And this is a pineal shape. It looks like a pine cone, and it might even be related to perfect, what we call pining or yearning. It looks like a screwing action. And it has embedded this nest of these, this shape we call the dodecahedron, which is simply uh, a shape which is based entirely on the golden ratio. So it's the beginning of the map to sacred geometry. And we see that is a particular shape which could embed itself one inside the, each other, just like these perfect little uh, uh, dolls where you see one inside the other. In fact, let's take a look at that in just one second. Remember when you you were a kid and your mother would give you these little dolls where you had the father doll, and the mother doll, and the little baby doll, and they all fit inside each other. Well, they had to be a certain kind of shape so that they all could nest one inside each other. And this possibility of embedding requires this perfect shape. And it appears that at this moment of compassion, when we feel heart harmonics that are so ordered like this, it's because we literally create a shape inside ourselves which is so much like the shape outside ourselves that it starts this little implosion, this suction, this fractal attractor, which is literally the turning inside out of the heart's magnetism made possible because the inside looks like the outside. This is called becoming self-similar, which turns out to be the principle of fractality or perfect embedding. So now we can look back at our animation and see how the squirt gun completes itself how that progression through the speed of light happens is because this wavelength and this wavelength and this wavelength are all in golden mean ratio. So they stand on each other's shoulders and they add and multiply recursively. And what they add and multiply recursively is not just their wave velocity, I'm not just their wavelength, but their wave velocity. So what happens is that the wave that comes out the end of this what's called heterodyning or perfect wave interference is that in radio theory, when the wave fronts stand on each other's shoulders, they create a squirt gun effect where the wave front can be pushed not just as wave length, but as wave velocity. And when that happens in perfect embedding, the wave goes through the speed of light out right here. And that's how you get that squirt gun through the speed of light, which may relate to our ideas about spirit and ensoulment. Now we're going to begin to understand how you have this, this shape of this magnetic X in your heart harmonics, which is reflected then in the cascade of harmonics where the fold of a braid on a braid on a longer wave braid all meets at one point in a perfect magnetic X in your DNA. And if the short waves ratio to the longer wave, to the longer wave yet, in that envelope inside an envelope inside a longer wave envelope, if that discipline of braiding, the hygiene in your DNA is braid dense or spin dense or charge dense or bliss dense, then the squirt gun works. And what happens is the adding and multiplying can happen inside your genetic material and you feel this implosion happen, which is the tingle you feel when you love somebody. When you you tripped over a shareable thought. You, you felt something so profound that your hair stood up. It's this magnetic rush you feel, which is a magnetic X. And what happens is that, I believe, literally, mechanically, sends that, that little zipper, that little lightning rod up the center of your DNA through the speed of light, in, in a sense, into time. And I believe that we could understand that lightning rod going through the speed of light as actually the beginning of the spiritual notion of soul. So once more to review, when these harmonics add and multiply not just their wave length, but their wave velocity in perfect wave interference, what comes off the tip of this perfect little vortex squirt gun is that this wave, which is the side view of a golden spiral on a cone, has been pushed through the speed of light. 
And that's the beginning of the superluminal or faster than light component up the zipper in your DNA. So visualize your genetic material getting this inertia that can push it through the speed of light literally into time. And that little tornado within a tornado when it gets going that fast is the coherence that may be related to the spiritual nation notion of soul. That ensoulment may be, re may be the result of this perfect braiding in your DNA. So the issue of this whole conversation is about the fact that if you lose this perfect symmetry in the braid, the mechanical structural distance between the envelope sizes, short wave within longer wave within longer wave yet, you may lose the ability to have this faster than light phenomena happen in your genetic material. What we're trying to say here in a fairly scientific way is the fact that Genetic engineered food may cost your children their soul. And that is, it seems strange to put it a such a spiritual notion in scientific terms, but in fact I believe that's what we're very close to, is we could describe the nature of what's sacred by describing the nature of what makes a wave sustainable. And waves become sustainable when they become compressible because there's no destructive interference. Perfect compression, perfect compassion, perfect fire, perfect awareness, perfect self-reference. So quantify or measure ability to self-refer. The golden mean spiral is the only angle at which a wave can re-enter itself, refer to itself, non-destructively. So self-reference, self-embedding may be the solution to self-awareness. So what we're suggesting is, in fact, the front end of that worm up the slinky of your DNA may in fact get an eyeball, be able to begin to steer itself. Remember the Buddha at the moment of the bliss and the rapture? You saw this snake or the serpent come out from the magnetic field of the pine-shaped pineal gland? And that the magnetic worm is able to steer itself around and make choices. The ability of a field effect to become self-aware, to, to have a conductor, the ability of a snake to be able to choose where to steer may depend on the fact of this perfect embedding of this magnetic X. So we're suggesting that magnetic fields become self-organizing when they emerge from chaos by becoming perfectly fractal golden mean ratio as the solution of perfect branching and bedding may be the solution of fractality. So to become self-similar or fractal electrically may be the solution to how field effects become self-aware because they simply become ability able to respond to so many harmonics at once because you can't get an infinite number of harmonics to nest at one point unless they're in phi, the golden ratio, knit, knit by phi or in phi knit, you have this sense at which the field effects concress or converge all to one point and they share one place where they can all throw their weight around at this like center of gravity and because there is this inner fire, this implosion around the heart, you get the ability to throw your weight around electrically. You create this charge implosion which may be exactly how capacitors, when they become self-embedded, make gravity. Gravity occurs when waves become self-similar. It's the solution of perfect compression, which Einstein sought when he said, how does infinite compression allow black holes to bend time? Now we know what perfect compression is. We know what makes gravity, charge becoming fractally implosive. We know how the heart makes a little bit of gravity because it makes centering force at the moment of bliss associated with this implosion going through the speed of light. And that implosion creates the possibility of a field effect that can become self-organizing, self-steering, self-aware. We did a presentation for the Deepak Chopra lab based on this that we could, by doing harmonic analysis, looking for the opening spaces in the heart becoming multiples of phi, and we could quantify self-awareness by measuring self-reference. 
So again, we have 10 golden mean spirals, perfect self-reference, from the side view on the cone. If we revolve that spiral that's squirted through the speed of light in three dimensions, we have a map of a cup within a cup. The cup within a cup has no inside or outside, and so it solves the problem of separateness. And because the spin density in the center could hold an infinite amount of pattern or spin, it can hold an infinite amount of information. And that spiral holds the shape of the feminine organs and the Sufi heart with wings, and you could zoom in forever and always see the same thing. Perfect nesting, perfect embedding, and the heart within heart of the perfect fractal. So just to look at that flavor one more time, golden mean spiral, perfect self-reference. Just to look at that golden mean spiral one more time in perspective, perfect self-reference, perfect self-embedding, provides a spin path to the center, perfect compression, which if we look at that golden mean spiral from the side view, where it then does get squirted through the speed of light and revolve it in three dimensions, we create a cup within a cup which is the holy grail. It has no inside or outside. It solves the problem of separateness. It's how self-embedding happens in the blood, the San Graal, the song in the blood. And it can hold an infinite amount of spin, which is an infinite amount of memory or pattern. It holds the Sufi heart with wings, the feminine reproductive organs, and you could zoom in forever and always see the same thing. Heart within heart, grail within grail, perfect self-embedding, perfect self-awareness, perfect fractal nesting. In this section, we're going to talk about how embedding in a fractal and the possibility of zooming in towards center, infinitely as it were, is the same thing as the charge density we feel as bliss. So the very heart nature of compassion as this ability to kind of turn inside out where a wave can focus inward infinitely is the model for how it is that we get charge density or braiding or eventually we're going to call it implosion right in the DNA. This section of our story will deal with a summary, a more sort of defense of the hypothesis that bliss is the purpose of DNA because this is what puts charge density in our genetic material. We're going to suggest the hypothesis here that when the genetic material braids in this way, there's something that goes faster than the speed of light up through the center of the DNA. And this superluminal kind of wormhole may well be a very useful uh, beginning of a description of what it is to become ensouled. It may have to do with what is able to loose a dream, because traveling faster than the speed of light also is how you really move in and out of time. And we're even going to discuss how this relates to what survives death in the bardo. So this discipline and hygiene for what's put spin in the genetic material may be a very important key and clue to really the survival of genetic memory of our species. This is going to lead us in this conversation to some pretty controversial topics having to do with even some discussion and literature review of probable extraterrestrial origins of our DNA. We're going to discuss a little bit about what it may have meant when they say the Nephilim were the fallen ones and what descent means genetically in terms of ability to keep this fire in the genetic material. What's really sort of self-empowering about this conversation is the notion that ultimately, if we're right, is that if you lose the ability to self-steer or self-implode in your heart, it's that electrical implosion which is ultimately responsible for creating the braid in your genetic material that then makes the genetic material what I call a good squirt gun. <laughs> So now we're going to play with a couple of pictures to help us visualize just exactly what we're talking about. The first one I call the Georgie Doxy Spins, based on the book Georgie Doxy's Power of Limits. And so in that movie, we notice that when waves coming to this point right here appear to come to a head, do you see how these waves appear to come to a head? And yet, 
the ratio of the lengths of these waves is 0.618 here, 1.0, 1.618, 2.618. So where all the waves converge at one point and phase lock may well be a place where their wavelength and their wave velocities add and multiply. So that may be a way to understand how the speed of the wave fronts is pushed through the speed of light in DNA. Because remember, as we played in this, in this animation the other day, when we took the dodecahedron and we ratcheted it down, and we saw the double helix there, and then we began to braid the braid, short wave, longer wave, and we began to see an envelope forming right in the genetic material, that ultimately what happens is you get a wave, whoops, let's go back there again. Let's not lose our place here. There we go. And it stopped, okay. You get a wave on a wave on a wave where the place where they all come to focus or agree, there is interaction between the phases of the wave. So here you have the short wave and here you have a longer wave yet. And in the nature of the genetic material, there is the possibility where the waves cross and make that X, where they all come to that one point, they add and multiply the speed of the front wave. We call that the magnetic X. And I'm going to play you just one more picture of that sort of magnetic X story. How's the radiance of your magnetic X? Remember that here's the braiding going down the DNA, and then you get that X formation, and then because of the nature of that X formation, at the cross point, you get this improved squirt gun where the harmonics coming out the X actually appear to probably go through the speed of light. So this is where we left off in our first part of the conversation, which was about, golly, it is probable that something superluminal is happening in the genetic material. A friend of mine named William Pensinger in Santa Fe has made measures of genetic material conducting signals faster than the speed of light. It's not unlike measures that have been done in monofilaments of gold, where if you take gold in a monofilament and you send high amperage through it at the moment of crystallization, when it changes from a liquid whisker to a crystallized skinny piece of wire, as it were, that at that moment, the gold monofilament can be measured to send magnetic signals, not only uh, uh, superconductively, that electrical resistance appears to go to zero. This is documented rather extensively in, in the literature. But also that the wave velocity, the propagation velocities, begin to become faster than the speed of light. And interestingly, there's even some suggestion that you can take the end of a gold monofilament and weld it to the end of a DNA monofilament and measure that faster than light ability. And so obviously we asked, have to ask geometrically what is the source of this phenomena where the genetic material appears to have very special electrical capabilities to send signals faster than the speed of light and as it were, with no resistance. And so for that, we're going to look at some models of what I call Creation Mechanics 101. And what I want to start with is a picture from the literature by this Professor Moon at the University of Chicago, where he was modeling the electron shell and the nuclear geometrics as platonic solids. And he specifically showed that palladium here, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but the palladium atom here is clearly dodecahedral. Uh, remember in our little animation that if we stellate the dodecahedron, let's go here to the greater maze, that if we stellate the dodecahedron, here's a dodeca, icasa, and an outer dodecahedron, this stellation of the dodeca, icasa, dodeca is such that we have this edge length ratio 0.618, and then the stellation is 1.0, the icasa 1.618, and this stellation, again, edge straight out, is 2.618. So you have this perfect embedding, which is simply a crisscross of all waves based on golden mean ratio, so they can all add and multiply. This is the geometry of DNA, earth grid, and zodiac, we believe, perfect embedding, and may, may relate to the city of Revelation models, the foundation stone of theosophy. And yet, it's simply a model of perfect implosion. So, 
in the discussions about how the genetic material may in fact create something superluminal, this three-dimensional shape, dodecahedron, it's, it's uh, in two dimensions it would look like Betsy Ross's drawing of stars within stars. It's the pentagonal star. And in that symmetry, the adding and multiplying of waves going to center can constructively interfere infinitely. And that's, we believe, the model of perfect compression, perfect implosion. So here we have a top-down view of DNA again, and we see that it's comprised essentially of this spinning dodecahedron, which has ratcheted down a helix. And again, we look at the pentagonal rungs of that ladder, and we're going to try to visualize a little bit more clearly how this is the key to the perfect, imp the perfect compression. So now we're looking down the zipper at the center of DNA, what light might feel like being accelerated through the speed of light because of that braiding. And the particular suggestion we'd like to make here, which is rather dramatic, is that there's a particular shape, this dodecahedron, which was the shape of Jodie Foster's vehicle in the movie Contact. And by assuming that position, the possibility of the compression down into the wormhole was enabled in the film. And she then inhabits these wormholes, and yet she then has this experience of, see this adding and multiplying down into this wormhole? Perfect heterodyning, perfect nesting, perfect embedding, perfect compression. And that again leads us to this idea of how this spin revolve into the grail cup, the perfect turning inside out nest we talked about. It seems to have no inside or outside. And yet we're seeing this as created directly from this experience of perfect nesting, embedding, compression. The grail cup. Sufi heart with wings, feminine reproductive organs. But in this zoom, instead of morphing into a fractal, we're going to morph into actually how stars, this is a NASA photograph now of the collision of major star system. And we see that if you actually zoom in to that center grail cup of the angel wings star cup grail formation, that it's actually a fetus, which actually has a black hole in the center. Alchemy means from the blackness. So something is squirting in there that requires this embedding. Okay. So that's just a very suggestive, almost poetic little visualization that indicates to us that when we get very still and we have a great deal of charge density, which may in fact relate to the phenomena of bliss radiating from the heart like a, like a snake charmer in a dance. That at those moments when the harmonics, what I call, concress, that there is the beginning of a little worming ability that occurs that enables you to literally steer into stars. Now at first, that sounds like a fairy tale, even in, this, in the serious mystery and serious connection books. The authors say, well, when the Egyptians said, in order to get out of here, you needed to be able to ride on the boat through the heart of the sun. They said, oh, that's not real physics. But I've actually come to believe that the nature of the way the electrical field of the heart, at these moments when it turns inside out so effectively, it creates this, it looks like a pine cone, but it's literally a screwing action, which takes the wave that was inside you and allows it to embed or fold itself into the wave nest of what was outside you. So at first you could visualize, you light this little fire in your heart, the implosion begins, you steer the fire around, just like you would steer the attention around inside your body, and you could feel the tingle even in your little finger when you place your attention in your little finger. If you move your attention there with lots of focus, you can feel a presence begin to grow around wherever it is you placed your attention. The placement of attention creates the still point around which then charge waves begin to grow like a, a nest inside a nest, like a donut inside a donut. And so the tingle you feel may literally be simply the result of the choice of the placement of stillness, which then aligns the wave nodes and begins the sorting of field effects which eventually results in this tingling or presence 
or feeling. So moving attention appears to be the ability to move this center of electrical implosion. And ultimately we're coming to understand that the very nature of gravity itself is likely usefully described as when charge waves arrange themselves in exactly that self-similar or fractal quality. So essentially we could say the reason you have gravity in an atom is because the nucleus is self-similar to the electron shells. As a result, the cascade inward can continue and you get this wind of charge towards center, which we have called gravity. Now you say, well, gee, uh, I wanted to watch a little film on the nature of DNA and the nature of consciousness. Why is someone trying to teach me the fundamental physics of a new theory of gravity? Well, the reason is rather simple. First of all, I believe that unless you can make your own gravity, you will be ultimately blown away in the magnetic wind of the sun. And we have lots of poetry about how emotions create centering force. And, uh, you know, you have butterflies in your stomach because you're not grounded, you're not embedded. So all of the poetry suggests, in fact, gravity has everything to do with emotion. What I'm su suggesting is we make this explicit in our physics and understand that gravity or centering force, G ray of Vita, is produced when we learn the skill of assembling this fire in the heart. And ultimately, you see, then we m can make the centering force that allows our glandular emotions to steer its way as a wave function into the centers of gravity of not just the body or the planet, but the sun and ultimately the stars. I personally have hundreds or at least dozens of friends who very explicitly tell me stories. One of them is right here with us now. And she tells us these great stories about what it is to see through the heart of the sun and travel. And more and more friends are able to do this and they're quite vivid and explicit about it. And I would suggest to our physicists that we can no longer ignore this phenomena of the ability to be able to see your way through the sun because it is a clue to what I believe is ultimately the way in which our collective genetic memory has a way to be harvested, has a way to travel into stars. If you remember in, in Starseed Transmissions at the end, you see this, you know, it's Ken Carey's book, you see this blue fire aura around the planet come to be self-organizing enough and then it appears to detach from the planet and sail through the sun into stars. The Templar name for those who could enter the sun was called solarions, solar eon, or they called them Baracoca, the clear ones. The Anunnaki were a story of those Ans who could travel through the sun, the solar logos, the solar beings. Every myth that, if we look deep enough, informs us that the ability to enter and inhabit the sun is the key to the way in and out of the gravity field of the solar system. This makes physical sense, and now I would like to understand that if we understand I'd like to suggest that if we understand the nature of glandular emotion making implosion, we can understand this in electrical terms. So to make this story kind of more fun and bring it closer to home, I'm going to now weave a little bit of a fairy tale, which is based in large part on some scholarship. The scholarship touches on uh, Zachariah Sitchin's stories of the Sumerian tablets, uh, the Sumerian tablets as enunciated in his books uh, 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 Genesis Revisited and um, uh, the many books uh, of, let's see, what were the other books of Zachariah Sitchin? Uh, Twelfth Planet, thank you very much. And so he has looked at the origins of Egyptian and the origins of the Bible and found them to be largely fairly poor translations of the Sumerian tablets. And looking closely at the Sumerian tablets, he's come to 
believe that these are stories of the arrival of an extraterrestrial family aboard an artificial gene-splicing planetoid called Nibiru, and the group were called the Anunnaki because they were in, a, in the descendants of An, uh, or Ea, E-A, for whom I believe Earth was named. And this word for An, for example, became the word for God in many languages, including the story of Tuatha, Tuatha de Danan, D apostrophe A-N-A-N, uh, from the Celtic, which literally means people of the gods, and even our Danube River, D-A-N, uh, and my name, Dan, all meant in the lineage of An, of the Anunnaki. So this word for being present with the gods is very, um, it's pervasive in our, our historical myths. So there's probably some truth to this scholarship on the Sumerian origins of our culture, which suggests an extraterrestrial origin. Now, I'd like to, to hint that there may be some great um, genetic meaning about the origin of what I'm calling ensoulment, or getting a soul, in the DNA when this implosion happens. In what was described in the um, Sumerian tablets and even in the Bible as what it meant to fall, as in the fallen ones, or uh, Lucifer, or more particularly Nephilim, or the order of the Nephites, which was transliterated literally as the fallen ones. What I'd suggest to you humbly here is the possibility that what it means to fall is literally the loss of the ability to implode or self-steer your own genetic material through the speed of light into time. The little uh, the little joke we've come up with from various sources here is that if you have to travel in time using heavy metal instead of genetic material itself, that means you're, quote, from the wrong side of the tracks, or it's, it's rather embarrassing, or you have fallen. In order to understand this principle we're suggesting that um, the genetic material loses this self-steering ability with the loss of bliss, and therefore the beginning of relying on external sources for that implosion in the DNA is the story of gold mining on this planet. And so that's this, this fun little story we're going to tell, which weaves together the theme of mana in the Bible and Ormes, as is described by David Hudson in orthomolecular ortho rearranged gold powder, essentially, uh, which is, sounds very similar to the wormy, the worm, and uh, the spice, as it was described in the book Dune, where you ate this powder, your eyes turned blue, and you became essentially able to steer yourself in time. And the story was that they came to this planet, the desert planet, Arrakis. And Arrakis, by the way, is literally a star in the star system Draco, from which we believe these Anunnaki came. In fact, I'd like to play you a little picture about this on the website uh, danwinter.com slash lionpath. So here is a picture of a Sumerian goddess statue uh, it's a goddess figurine from the Ubayad, and here is a drawing of the way the Syrian Anunnaki versus what were called the Draco from Alpha Draconis, which is where the star uh, Arrakis is located. And Draco, incidentally, is the shape of the Arabic letter L, and um, it's the layout of Angkor Wat, and the pyramids at Senshi in China. And here's another drawing of a Draco from various people who believe they've seen them, and there are many. But what I'd like to play for you here is a little animation. Maybe we could zoom in on this for just a second. So here's the drawing of a Draco or Orion queen in that sense, morphed to this Sumerian goddess statue. And the similarity is rather evident. Now, this is perhaps a bit overdramatic, and you could say a bit speculative, and you would be right. 
But there's too much evidence on our planet of this relationship of ancient interventionism and culture. We just um, spent a delightful evening with a doctor here yesterday who told us a story about how the Mongolian culture uh, inspired what became the Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, Kazakhs, the Kazakhs, the Khazars, and which became the Ashkenazi, which then became the branch of the, the Jewish tradition, which he painted this elaborate picture of how uh, the Bank of England and all the Masonics were all influenced by this Ashkenazi order. And so you get this kind of classic um, New World Order story, which all of us have heard pieces of. And one of the storals to that little Maury, however much you believe it, it usually is to see how our gene pool has, in a way, it seems, been parasitized. or. Another way to look at it is uh, some of us believe that the Magdalen lineage was another name for the Mogs of the Orion Queens, this culture from Orion, and uh, yet the Mog lineage becomes the inspiration for Magdalen's children whom the Templars are protecting, and the Templars install insurance and banking for the first time in the West, which then gets bad press under the same skull and bones of Magdalen, purportedly, and the insurance and banking with the same largest navy on the planet with bad PR is called the Pirates. And then that same skull and bones does the insurance and banking on the psychoactive substances, which is the drug cartel of the CIA, started by the Order of Skull and Bones, regulating the psychoactive substances. And always, it's kind of a tax on access to the wormhole via access to external sources of psychoactive substance, in this case drugs. Well, if we look at the purported reputation of this Orion culture, uh, and I reference in this regard uh, several books, one in particular, uh, Guardians of the Grail by Robert Morningsky, where he purports to interpret significant portions of their language based upon their genetic roots in the shape of what we would call the Velociraptor. Now this is not to say that everything reptilian is evil, because I strongly believe that that chutzpah, that strength, that power, that guts, that juiciness up the reptilian brain stem is what gives us the ability to have powerful Kundalini and Tantra and bliss and squirt through the stars. So the downside of the story is, yes, there was a fallen element of that what may be draconian and related interventionism among the Anunnaki and uh, this stories we have about the firefight under Dulce where the Dracos killed such a high number of our the American fastest crack Navy SWAT teams uh, like they were flies and yet at the same time and, and also you have these many stories about uh, uh, um, abduction of humans and the eating of live glands, which you can understand because if you lose the ability to make glandular juice, then naturally you need an outside source for that. We call that the addictive personality. Yet, on the other hand, you have this incredible story in Genesis of the Grail Kings by Lawrence Gardner, where he exquisitely narrates that this Draco family, he says explicitly historically Draco, became our story of the dragon cult, and Sumer, S-U-M-M-A-I-R-E, as in Sumeria, the Sumerians, literally means the dragon family or the reptiles in Celtic, you see. so. Here is Gardner telling the story about how the Anunnaki fabricated the high end of their genetic experiments in the Cain and Abel story, which the word Cain, as in Cain and Abel, C-A-I-N, becomes the word C-A-Y-I-N, which becomes our word for king. And he says this is the first in the lineage of the Grail Kings. And this was, in fact, an extended experiment, and it was it was the same kind of genetic engineering they did to install the kings and queens in the royal houses of Europe for thousands of years that we do and think nothing of when we breed show dogs or show horses. It's the same kind of skill or activity. 
And we think at first this is sacrilegious. And indeed, if the, if the bliss, if the spontaneity, if the freedom goes out of these bloodline crosses, we do indeed lose the passion and bliss that ensouls DNA. And we get, as a result, the what I call the Borg Queen phenomenon. So what I'd like to try to describe now is the principle of how it is that those who become externally addicted to what it is that puts fire in their blood eventually become fallen or Borg-like, uh, which I call the addictive or mucus-making personality, versus those who learn to make that fire from the inside out, the glandular skill to build Phi's ray implosion in the heart's voltage that starts this turning inside outness happening recursively in the field effect in the center, the electrical center of gravity of the body, that ultimately then creates the sound ponytail that braids the DNA into the implosion that ensouls or squirts through the speed of light into time. So for this little story, we're going, to use, we're going to use the specific example of what happened to the, uh, what we're going to call the Nephilim, which you might think of as the uh, fallen ones of the Anunnaki, the Nephites. Uh, Thoth is telling us, you need no longer be just spawn of the Anunnaki. And what I'd like to, or even spawn of the Nephilim, and what I'd like to suggest to you of how it is that we emerge from that role. Because clearly, at first, it's a little bit humbling to think that all our noble stories of spiritual ancestry and Adam and Eve in the Bible and the story of Genesis is mostly some fairly klutzy genetic engineering and cloning by some medium-grade reptilians. I mean, this is not, how shall we say, this is not, um, this doesn't give us a quality feeling for where our parents came from. And yet, I'd like to suggest to you that there's a deeper meaning here, which is actually quite inspiring and quite spiritual. And to get at that meaning, we need to tell a little bit more of the story of this gold powder. See, what we believe happened was that the Orion Queen culture uh, used the um, technology that we see in beehives today to create a royal family. They used royal jelly. Gardner describes this in some detail. And the royal jelly for the Orion Queens was the high serotonin, melatonin content of pineal pituitary secretions that, when consumed, could help implode at the glandular level more powerfully the juices in the incarnating spiritual leader, or avatar, or messiah. Gardner is suggesting that the word, well, first of all, the way, one of the ways they fed this royal jelly was the menstrual blood of trained, vest, quote unquote, vestal virgins, which is very high in serotonin melatonin. And this was called the oil of messe, M-E-S-S-E-H, which literally means juice of the crocodile, or best blood of the reptilians, from which comes our word Messiah. Well, one of the things that happens when you lose the ability to have passion, glandular bliss, fire in your eye, snap, crackle, pop, when you lose this is you lose the ability to make the serotonin melatonin. I used to joke with a friend of mine, uh, she would say, uh, on my way home from the cappuccino bar today, I realized that maybe I hadn't yet harvested any memories for the galactic core today, which means no bliss, nothing shareable, no charge density. <laughs> Another way she used to put this was she would say, when was the last time your nostrils flared? And you see your nostrils kind of flare a little bit at that moment of bliss because the shape of the vortex of oxygen in the breathing process is focused into the nadis by the shape of the nostrils. Another fun story about that is 
The ancient saying was, the shape of the underside of your nostrils is the shape of the favorite whole grain of your ancestors because that's the way they consume their fire. And the way you, bra you braid your fire in your nose is the way that you assemble spin into density. Well, to continue the little story, so what I think happened was that with the loss of the ability to make this fire in the blood, which has resulted in the song in the blood, San Greal, which is literally, remember the piezoelectric slinky of the DNA, long wave coupled to short wave? Well, that sound, when it's working well in imploding DNA, is a ringing in your ear that's literally the ringing in your DNA, song in the blood, San Greal, which is, in a sense, very wave mechanically, the voices of all the ancestors whose shape is morphically folded into your DNA. Well, when the ringing stops, what do you do? Some things happen. One thing that happens is that if you lose bliss over many generations, women lose the ability to propagate an immune system into the thymus of their children. The reason for this is because the thymus is a catcher's mitt, remember, around the heart. Thy am us, thy am us. And the catcher's mitt is accustomed to receive, receiving the sound shadow of the blissful heart, which is, creates the immune identity where the ingredients of the white blood cells are cooked up in the thymus according to the instructions heard from the blissful heart. So doctors today say, well, the thymus usually shrinks with age. I think they're mistaken. What happens is the thymus shrinks when the heart stops singing. As long as the heart's singing, the thymus remains a good catcher's mitt because it's catching the song of the heart. Well, the thymus began to shrink as they, quote-unquote, fell. And what happened was the DNA had no added uh, uh, ponytail snake charmer to keep the braiding into implosion, into that charge density. And so eventually the DNA literally slows down or becomes less superconductive and there's less going through the speed of light up the zipper, up the DNA. And I believe that is a useful but not complete wave mechanical description of what it means to quote unquote the fallen ones. You see, with this process of loss of spin density in the genetic material, remember this is very likely to happen when you eat genetically engineered food where they forgot that it's the braiding that makes the spin, not just the codon sequence. So if they don't know what makes a soul, don't let them cut up your genes. So what happens when they lost the ability to squirt this faster than speed of light worm up the genetic material, they lost the ability to lucid dream, they lost the ability to carry coherent memory through death, and they lost the ability to travel in time without using external heavy metal props. Essentially, they lost the ability to shamanically navigate stars. Remember, Shem An is the Sumerian phrase to raise the Shem stone which is to raise the highward fire stone, which you could visualize as the tower of Babel, of Baal, of, of, uh, of Enlil and Enki. The tower of Babel was the same shape as a pine cone of the pineal gland, which is a Shem stone. The highward fire stone was simply a zodiac magnetic landscape, which we'll see in a minute. We'll play some pictures where you see this golden spiral on the plateau at Giza around the Great Pyramids, for example. That's an example of a highward firestone or a Shem stone, a zodiac temple landscape, where you create a magnetic fractal on the land, which you can then use like a lens, like a squirt gun, to squirt your magnetic, your genetic magnetism, your glandular juices from your body, through the magnetic lens in the land, through the sun, into stars. So. One of the things they lost was the Shem An, the Anunnaki, the Shemonic, the shamanic ability to squirt themselves into stars. And so their 
star elders. The star elders of the Anunnaki were the Solarians, the Veracoca, the clear ones, the ones who could inhabit the sun. They came through the sun. All of the legends, whether it's South American, Egyptians, always say they came through the heart of the sun. We see that the heart of the sun, seen clairvoyantly, looks just like a human heart. It's that perfect slipknot of turning inside out Ness. So the result of their fall in Ness was that they had to find an external source for this spin. And let's tell this story with some more pictures. We'll take a little break. In order to make the story more visual before we continue about the source of their external fire, let's play some pictures about how that star map worked. So here is this golden mean spiral on the plateau at Giza. And here is the three, the, the geometric relationship between the three major star systems it pointed to. You have in this perfect 60 degree implosion cone shape, the spin path to Pleiades, and Sirius as a 60 degree right angle and declination cone, which is the implosion cone, with Orion at the midheaven, and Earth here is at the center. This cone was called Peshmaten by the Hopis. It was called uh, uh, Deep Space Nine in the movie. It meant one less, less than ten, or the way of nine. And the wormhole that was created in the gravity wind by the arrangement of these heavy stars was used for the transport, commercial trade wind for star transport. And Earth was located at the foci, so the solar system was valuable politically, among other reasons, for its location in real estate. Here is another picture of how the three pyramids on the Giza Plateau line up like the three belt stars of Orion, and you have this sphinx at the cross point. And this star map on Orion literally points to a place where if you, supposing you were, had just gone to sleep in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid and you were looking for a place in the stars which fit the morphic fractal resonance of where you were on the land and you would end up wanting to zoom into the stars in a place where there was a pattern fit, where uh, again, by morphic resonance, you could find the place where your magnetism fit the stars from your local terrain, so the squirt gun could work. And as you could see, that where you are pointed to is literally a black hole in the center of the man of the body of Orion, which it's, whether or not it's a black hole, it's at least one of the areas that's most pregnant for starbursts. See, it goes through the three belt stars, Alnatak, Alalam, and Mintaka, and Bellatrix. And we see that in this place, in Orion, and this is where we zoomed in that Grail Cup before, that it appears that something is creating the suction. This is starbursts happening dynamically in NASA footage. And if you asked a physicist what was sucking all the mass in toward a center point to make it look like a living cell being born, the physicist would say increasing gravity. But I'm suggesting to you that what actually creates that, what in part actually creates that suction to center is the added recursiveness that has made the system self-organizing, which is actually requires the insertion of the self-awareness, which we'll later see may be related literally to what is the birth of angels or star bodies, uh, solar beings. This little animated sequence is about what I call pull yourself to, together, Osiris. Remember, Osiris's body was missing a penis, which was the projective point of the sperm. If we look at the picture again, we see that we've assembled the piece, pieces of a puzzle like the body of Osiris. I'll just back up a little bit. See how there's puzzle pieces? The metaphor here is that it takes a certain wave mechanic to assemble stars into a form that allows them to have bodies. And that's what we want to talk about here. So back to our story, now that we've looked at a few visuals. The story was, here they were realizing they had lost a glandular source of bliss. 
and therefore there was no centering force and so nothing to engender charge density in their DNA, the implosion that ensouls. One of the stories that's told is many of the fallen one, including some of these Dracos, eventually would have two hearts instead of one, which resulted in a loss of centering force biologically. And this was, in fact, told from the people who met them at Dulce and elsewhere. Um, but the other major thing that happened is they became uh, addicted to eating a replacement for the melatonin serotonin, which was gold powder, the mana ormi spice. And the reason gold powder, I believe, works uh, is because the outer valence electron shell of the what they call the noble gases or the uh, noble elements, uh, not unlike palladium, uh, although palladium is not identical, that the outer electron shells, which are called the SPDF subshells, the, the DF subshells is a 10-14 electron array, which is 5-7 donut pair, which is a dodeca icasa array in symmetry. So essentially, gold is noble because it is so fractal atomically. It creates implosion at the atomic level. So when you submit it to lots of charge, it turns inside out effectively because it has so much centering force. Where it changes mass, turns white. It looks like popcorn. Uh, David Hudson calls it orthomolecularly rearranged. It's white powder. But the wonderful phenomena is that it becomes soluble in water and blood. And that solubility in water and blood allows it to reorient the water molecules around that implosive symmetry, creating electrical implosion at the atomic level in the blood. Now, as we saw, that when you create implosion, you create sorting. So what happens in the, in the blood when you eat gold powder is that all of the magnetic fields, which are not sustainable, are sorted out. That may sound overly simplistic, but I believe it's literally a description of how you fabricate a technologically immortal immune system. Now, in fact, it was very clearly described biblically and in Dune, and it's also described scientifically in David Hudson, that eating the gold powder uh, drastically lengthens lifespan. In fact, they're joking now that you're only dollars away from immortality. So what was the problem? Why not just eat the gold powder and live forever? Well, this is a problem discovered after millennia by the fallen ones, the Nephites, okay? Uh, what happened was that if you rely on an external unifying source to implode your DNA, the addictive gold powder, you eventually have no individuation because the source of the fire is the source of what makes you, you. We call it I dent, I tie. What ties the dents together on the soap bubble surface is the phase implosion that locks the harmonics that makes an immune system. In biophysics, it's called structural stability and morphogenesis. It means that every living cell is simply a sum of different waves that are able to nest together because they're phase musical. So if anything out of phase tries to get on the cell membrane, it's canceled out. That's how you get an immune system. So ident, I tie, identity, how to make a dent on the surface of a soap bubble, is this ability to sort. And where, wherever the fire comes from is what sorts the waves and creates identity. Well, if the source of your fire is outside in instead of inside out, then you use technology instead of emotion eventually to bend stars. This is called the technos or the logos, <laughs> which is the logos versus technology, which is the essential difference between the Ophanim and the Seraphim in a poetic kind of way, or the fallen ones and those who are still Solarian. The addictive personality, which uses an outside source of fire, begins to create mucus, like those who drink alcohol and uh, take stimulants like coffee and tobacco, because the self-not-self -self barrier begins to get confused because you start to burn yourself and not know the difference between your not-self if the source of the fire was not internal instead of external. 
Again, this is how you can tell if a religion is self-empowering, if they say all fire, all power, all God is within you. And you don't need to make a, pay a tax to any priest or anything outside you to access that fire, then that's self-empowerment. Well, when they became addicted to the gold powder, they lost self-empowerment because they lost the source of the fire that first decided how to turn inside out, that started the implosion that did the sorting, fire in the heart. Anyway, so here they came here now. Our planet was so well situated in this dodecaconic of these 12 faces of the pent zodiac that large amounts of gold had precipitated in our grid precisely because the magnetism crossed in that dodecafractal array because we were so well situated with respect to the faces of stars. So the arrangement of our planet so fractally with respect to stars made the capacitance of those planets, those stars, as they affect us, astrologically the proper embedding nutrient for not just gold to form in the mineral veins, but also for the growth and production of self-awareness in general. So astrologically and astronomically, gravity is charge gone fractal. When stars arrange themselves well into a fractal, you create this excellent cookbook for cooking up self-awareness in gene pools because the embedding is so complete that the gene pools are able to grow, grow up and inhabit the stars which are in our image and likeness. So you had a lot of gold precipitated in the vein structure of Earth. We were considered valuable for our mineral deposits alone. They didn't realize that the gene pool here was also valuable. And so the Orion Consortium, as it were, which ruled a high percentage of the inhabitable planetoids in the Orion sector in a reign of terror. Uh, because after they had become rather addicted to this gold powder, this mana ormi spice, what onset was a condition where there was only one source of the fire. It was mechanical. And they became more and more interested in the, uh, what's the TV show, the Calypso? The techno. Te the techno, the techno Calypse, right. Uh, that was the TV show that says, you too can become a Borg. It is a privilege to be assimilated. Just insert a chip in your body and you can become like everyone else. Uh, biology is getting behind and machines are getting ahead. Well, that's precisely the sentiment which started the Orion Wars, referred to in Star Trek as the Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes Back, which was essentially a story of those who were in a hive mind, total telepathy culture, which was almost entirely machine-based with little pieces of biology glued in here and there to make it fun, versus a culture of the remnant humanoids who still used some passion and bliss. And they were in part descended from what were called the dog-bird brain, the Dogon, the Wialawa, the bird tribe, the Ophanim versus the Seraphim. So in the Empire Strikes Back kind of story, the situation is essentially between those who have fallen into this hive mind. The reason they fell into hive mind was because when there's only one source of fire, it phase embeds everyone and you have total telepathy. The problem with total telepathy is that you no longer can imagine yourself separate. So no one gets to experience the agony of separateness. And as a result, no one learns anew the skill to turn inside out and feel outside as if it were inside, we call compassion. So with the end of the birth of, the, of new compassion was the end of the birth of new individuation, which was the beginning of total telepathy and hive mind. The hive mind uses only hexagonal structures which are membrane making and incubating. Whereas the bliss passion group uses pentagonal structures, which the church says the pent is bad and yet says repent and be saved. We know that penting is simply the process of the golden ratio becoming self-embedding. It's the square root of five is how you derive the golden ratio. So it's in five-ness is in phi-net. So this, this would be an image of that idea of repent and be saved to embed is to have compassion. And you see how this onset of recursion creates this principal embedding 
which is this principle of charge density. Let's look further here at this summary of these principles on the same page. Okay. So we're, this is just another summary before we go on with our story. We've said the hard EKG voltage learns bliss, the result of perfect compassion, which is compression without pain, non-destructive compression. We, we say that perfect implosion equals inner fire, which is the same as fire. To be self-similar fractal is to feel inside the same as what is felt outside. So to be able to self-refer, and remember the golden spiral is the only angle at which a wave can re-enter itself non-destructively, to be able to self-refer, able to refer to yourself, is to be able to self-embed, is to be able to be self-aware. Again, fractality equals embeddability equals non-destructive compressibility equals turning inside out-ness equals scale invariance to be able to be compressed, the scale changes, the, the ratio remains the same while the scale changes. Ratio is profane, scale is sacred. I'm sorry, scale is profane, ratio is sacred. So scale invariance equals spin density, equals information density, equals charge density, equals sustainability, equals shareability. And you see here in this, this actually became a course on managing chaos for business people. This equals market ability. It's literally the ability to create the perfectly distributable wave function optimized by this golden spiral ratio called phi low taxis. Perfect branching is actually a deep and profound principle for how marketing, how business should happen. It's, it's like in the primer on rotation and a primer on energy book series by Christ and Einstein, they said that there would be no shortage of energy and any resource if we didn't try to sh store if we only distributed. But to have perfect distribution with no phase delay, no latency, uh, <laughs> I called to mind for a second the pictures of what they call internet storms. You know, you have a picture in the sky and it's a storm, all these clouds going around, you say, oh, if you really understood long waves of electrical pressure, you'd understand that they were literally collective emotion. And then you look at these pictures of where there are traffic jams in the global World Wide Web, and they call them internet storms. And they are, quite literally, uh, traffic jams or waves of collective emotion, right? Well, the way you can best get your packet through the the this World Wide Web is to make a map of latency. I credit this idea to my friend Tom Belial, where he explains that if you're sending a packet around the web and you simply make a map of where the packets get slowed down, eventually you can make a map of where latency, that is delay, or what, the only thing that slows down the web is attempt to store. If there was no attempt to store, you'd have infinite conductivity, which would be perfect distribution. I give you another example. This is the from the Buckminster Fuller book, uh, Nine Chains to the Moon. If you had billiard balls in a row between here and the moon, if there was uh, one millimeter between each billiard ball, and you hit the one ball at this end, it might take a year for the ball at the other end to pop off. But if the billiard balls from here to the moon were all touching each other, and you hit the billiard ball at this end, the billiard ball at the other end at the moon would pop off instantly faster than the speed of light. So the only thing that interferes with the possibility of infinite or infinite wave distribution, shareability, is literally phase delay. Phase delay goes to zero when compression is perfect, and so you have this perfect instant faster than the speed of light distribution network, which is how e pluribus becomes unum, how waves become self-organizing, how ability to respond is the result of many waves, an infinite number of waves can come to one point in finite. And so you're able to respond to all those waves at once, and that's the moment at which the eyeball at the head of the worm that is your genes appears to begin to choose how to steer itself. It's literally a a donut that's squeezing itself inside out, but it's a long tube, so it looks like a serpent. I mean, people, if you see what digestion is, are really just a long tube. And digestion is where you squirt through the middle. Well, 
That's essentially how magnetic fields learn to digest starlights. And when the implosion geometry is right, the front end of the worm gets an eyeball. That's called, uh, well, there are many poetries for that, but one is the, called the Lazarus Effect. Uh, Lays are us in the book, in the Dune series. Another is called uh, Quetzalcoatl Returns, the many plumed one, which is, that's how the serpent comes to feed the eagle. See, the amygdala is literally the mouth of the reptilian brain stem. Amygdala is the name for the journal on fractals. Its shape is the almond shape of exactly where two golden spirals cross, and the almond shaped uh, 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 is this then the, how you get sweetness squeezed in the amygdala of the brain dripping onto the base of the tongue in the sort of plumbing 101 hydrodynamics of bliss juice pumping. And then this mouth of the reptilian brainstem amygdala, the, the nut shape of the fractal, uh, in fact, uh, magdala, amygdala means to tower. Uh, uh, mag is uh, the Orion queen, the, the that, that Magdalen was the leading edge of this bloodline in the dynastic union of Jesus and Magda in the Grail bloodline. So here is the Mag deciding if it's going to take its bliss juice and pump it out the mouth of the serpent into the bird brain. And that's how the serpent feeds the eagle and Quetzalcoatl returns. And that's kind of the story of bliss.